Welcome to Exploring the Gospels. In today's message, Meet John, Dr. McLuhan introduces us to a fisherman who became Jesus' closest friend. The Zebedee family ran a fishing business in the town of Bethsaida on the northern rim of the Sea of Galilee. Bethsaida was situated where the Jordan River flows into the Sea of Galilee. And some archaeologists believe that they have found one of the larger homes uncovered in Bethsaida that may have been the ruins of the Zebedee compound, the Zebedee homestead. Now, in addition to their sons who worked with their father, they hired employees to help their fishing business grow. In addition to having hired employees, they had business partners. Simon and Andrew, who were also from Bethsaida, were in partnership with the Zebedees, the Zebedee House of Fish. Now, at that time, Simon lived with his mother-in-law in nearby Capernaum, not far from the hot springs where the fish come to spawn. I've walked in those seven springs, and you can feel the hot and the cold water as you just walk through those springs uh, out into the sea. They bubble up into the sea from underground. And what a blessing it is to see that fishing hole. So life was good in those days, except for one thing, the Russian, (laughs) Russian, (laughs) the uh, Roman occupation whom everyone despised. Uh, The Zebedee family seemed to have had somehow connections with members of the high priest's family in Jerusalem. Uh, Some scholars believe they may have had an annual contract to supply the high priest's family with salted fish uh, from their business in Galilee. Consider this very interesting remark in John chapter 18 and verse 5. We read that John was known to the high priest. That's all we get. Don't you wish you knew more about that? Now, at the birth of Jesus, God made sure that the religious leaders in Jerusalem knew that a Savior had been born. That's why the angels sang and the shepherds went to tell. They were shepherds who took care of the flock, uh, sacrificial animals for the temple. And so an announcement was made that way. And Jesus announced the beginning of his ministry in an important synagogue in Nazareth. And when uh, he arrived on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, he began choosing disciples. Amongst the first disciples Jesus chose were two sons from this prominent family, the Zebedee family. Uh, It was one more way that God let the high priests know Messiah had arrived. Listen to Mark's words. Going a little further, Jesus saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending nets, and immediately he had called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him, Mark chapter 1, verse 19 through 20. From that moment on, the course of the Zebedee's family, the course of their whole family's life changed forever had no idea what a change would come to them. You see, every Jewish boy dreamed of being chosen by a rabbi, but until this moment, none of the local rabbis had shown any interest in Zebedee's sons. You can be sure that their father was disappointed that their sons had not been chosen, especially from such a prominent family. But Jesus saw in James and John more than a lifetime of fishing in Galilee. Jesus saw in them fire that he could transform into mighty men for the kingdom he was establishing. Mark wrote that Jesus called them sons of thunder. May not sound exactly complimentary, but Jesus is always looking for people with fire in their belly to follow him and to harness that fire for the purposes of God's kingdom. Now, before choosing James and John to follow him, he had already invited Andrew and Simon to follow him. So he did so in the usual manner that rabbis did to invite young men to come and study with them. A rabbi picked a student simply by saying, follow me. So Andrew and Simon and James and John 
all knew what it meant when Jesus said, follow me. It's significant that the first of the four disciples that Jesus chose to follow him were rowdy best friends. Uh, think about that for a moment. Uh, as you read the Gospels, there were uh, more times or several times that Jesus called men to follow him. And sometimes it takes more than one encounter with Jesus to make the kind of commitment that he is asking us to make to follow him. For this group of friends, that moment came in connection with the first miraculous catch of fish. A crowd was pressing in to hear Jesus teach and heal and all the amazing things Jesus did. And Jesus, sensing the press on them, said to Peter, could I use your boat as a platform? And Peter was happy to accommodate. Jesus rode out just a little bit. After the sermon was over, Jesus asked Peter to row a little bit deeper, put out into the deep of the words that Jesus used for a catch of fish. You'll remember this interesting story that Jesus protested because they had fished all night and caught nothing. If you ever come up empty-handed, if you've come up empty-handed, you need Jesus in the boat with you. And these famous words, Peter said, at your bidding, Lord, after protesting, I will do it. And so he put down his net. Peter was astonished beyond belief. The catch was so large that James and John had to jump in their boats quickly and row out to where Peter was to keep Peter's boat from sinking. What an extraordinary event. <clears throat> Peter was so undone by this experience that he felt unworthy to follow Jesus. Do you remember those words he said? Depart from me, I am a sinful man. And sometimes it's not until we come to terms with our own bankruptcy and our own emptiness and that we can actually, Jesus can actually do something with us. He's not looking for what we have to help him. He's looking to use what we don't have and to give it to us. And so these men, Peter followed him on that day. Now, Jesus' response was so precious. Do not be afraid, Jesus said. From now on, you'll be catching men. And when they, that is James and John, who were there now, had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Luke chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. Now, Zebedee was about to lose his sons, and he was okay with that, but isn't it the grace of God that he gave him a great catch of fish to send them off and help them with the business? And there'd be more bumps along the way, but Jesus was ready to train his growing team to fish for men and for women to become his followers. Of course, it was unheard of for a rabbi to choose women, and yet Jesus chose women, and they followed him. These two important families had connections uh, that uh, between the families that is helpful for us to know about. Let me mention the first one. It's the connection between John the Baptist and Jesus. Uh, when Mary re revealed to her parents that she was carrying Jesus, they sent her to stay with the godly couple called Elizabeth and Zechariah. They would think of them as the family priest. And when you get in trouble, don't you go to the person in the family who's maybe the most connected with God and say, what do we do about this? And so there they were with this godly couple. And God had prepared them to receive Mary. Zechariah was fulfilling his priestly duty when the angel appeared and told him that he and his wife uh, would have a son. Remember, she was older and barren and that he was to call her him uh, John, their son John. We know him as John the Baptist. So to make the connection, it appears that Mary's mother and Elizabeth were sisters. And this means that John the Baptist was an older second cousin to Jesus. As the story unfolds, it helps us to see the family connection. Now, an even more interesting connection is to consider the mother of James uh, and John. Zebedee's wife's name was Siloam. And she, too, became a follower of Jesus, and there's a story about her. When we read all of the gospel accounts related to the crucifixion, we read that there were four women 
who stood by Jesus at the crucifixion. Sir John wrote, standing by the cross where his mother and his mother's sister, that's a clue right there, and then another person, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So there are four women standing. So who is the mystery sister of Mary? And when we go to the other gospels, we'd be able to figure out uh, some of, uh, we are able to figure out that other person's name. This is what Mark said. Some women were watching from a distance. Amongst them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the, and uh, the younger, and of Joseph and Siloam. So there we get that name. So what is Mary's sister's name? It's a lady by the name of Siloam. So many believe that Siloam is an older sister to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And if that is correct, then James and John are first cousins to Jesus. And this helps understand two very important incidents in the gospel. Uh, <clears throat> Has this text ever caused you to wonder? Then the mother of James and the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him something. What do you want me to do? She said, these two sons of mine, I want them to sit, one at your right and one at your left in your kingdom. Matthew chapter 20 Verse 21. Now, now that we know that Siloam is Mary's oldest sister, that makes him an aunt to Jesus. And doesn't this sound like the kind of thing that a powerful aunt might feel empowered to do? And aren't you glad to know that Jesus had some family issues as well? Whether or not this is true, it helps understand more about the connections that Jesus made to these men that he called to follow him. So on a more serious note, <clears throat> it also helps us understand why Jesus placed his mother in the care of John before he was crucified uh, because he was a first cousin of Jesus and related directly to Mary himself. John took care of Mary Mary, for the rest of her life, what a blessed thought that is. Now, when King Agrippa killed John's brother James, it became clear that it was unsafe for John or Mary, Jesus' mother, to stay in Judea. And many believe that it was at this moment that John took Mary and left Judea and went to Ephesus to become the pastor of the church where Paul had planted uh, several years prior. Uh, it must have been thrilling to pastor a church with the mother of Jesus as your best member. And every now and then you could just say to Mary, isn't that right, Mary? <laughs> isn't that right, mother? And di didn't Jesus do it that way? Mary, would you just give us a testimony today of some of the things that you saw Jesus do? And so what a blessing it is to think about these things and how Mary lived her life to an old age and John as well. Uh, it is believed that, uh, that uh, Mary lived in a home up in the mountains behind the city of Ephesus. I've had the privilege of going in that mountain, up that mountain and visiting that home and to think about all of these things that I am sharing with you today. Well, the apostle John authored more than the gospel of John. He wrote three short letters to encourage the believers for 2nd and 3rd John. The main theme of these letters is the love of God. And he begins his first letter with these words, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He was the word of life. What an introduction. You talk about a, the power of an eyewitness. We saw him. We touched him. We ate with him. We watched all the things that he did. A tremendous eyewitness. Credible 
person to write a gospel on the life of Jesus. He went on to write, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves God has been born of God and knows God, and anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Now, as persecution rose against the church, John was taken uh, uh, from Ephesus by the Romans to the prison colony on the island of Patmos and put to hard labor. And it was there that we believe he wrote the book of Revelation. And again, we read out of Revelation these remarkable words, I, John, I'm your brother and your partner in suffering and in the God's kingdom, and in the patient endurance to which Jesus called us, I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. So while there, we believe that John wrote the letter to the seven churches at the beginning of the Revelation. They were in Asia Minor under his care. He warned them about losing their first love. It's definitely a theme in John's life. It's it's all about love. It's not about doing. It's about love. He went on to release the great revelation about what will happen as we reach the end of time and the return of Jesus to call his followers home. I've existed, uh, I have visited this traditional cave where John received the revelation You know, I've been to many places in the world. Of all the places I've visited, this Patmos has a special place in my heart. Spent time roaming through the old Roman ruins up in the high places of that mountain and thought about John giving us this great revelation and all the powerful things he writes and looking forward to that great time when the world comes to an end and we're called into the presence of God to be with him forever. Now, tradition tells us that John was released from Patmos and returned to Ephesus, where he pastored the church that he loved. And of all of the apostles, we believe he's the only one that lived to an old age, maybe into his 90s, and was not martyred for his faith. He suffered tremendously, but he lived out his life and passed away there. Justinian built a church some years later when churches began to get buildings And it's believed that that church was built to preserve the gravesite of St. John. Many people go there, whether or not that's the exact location or whether it's fabricated, one might not know for sure, but it has been a blessing to visit that grave and think about this amazing man, John, that we are talking about today. Even though John is in heaven today, he's very much alive and with us because of the writings that he left for us to read. When groups of people being introduced to the message of Jesus for the first time, as we sometimes refer to as unreached people groups, the first book to be translated into their language is the Gospel of John. And so John's Gospel has been translated more than any other book in the world. And listen to this powerful introduction that John gives us in his Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, And the word was God, and he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Very strong statement, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. He begins with identifying Jesus as logos, a Greek word for logos, so the meaning of that Greek word is word. And Jesus, John is telling us, is the living word of God, the manifest presence of God upon the earth. And this is what John wants his readers to understand about who Jesus is. So let's replace the word word and put in Jesus and re-listen to this introduction that John is actually making. Jesus was in the beginning. Jesus was with God. Jesus was God, Jesus was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Jesus, and without Jesus, nothing was made that was made. That's the understanding that people who received John's gospel 
understood immediately about what John was saying about Jesus. Aren't you so glad? This immediately helps us understand, although God is one, he is more than one. And all of this identity connects us uh, through John's writing with Jesus and God are being one. Now, Jesus built an inner circle of three friends, and we know them as Peter, James, and John. Uh, these three saw some of the most dramatic miracles that Jesus did, including raising of Jairus' daughter, the synagogue leader, the principal or the president of the synagogue in Capernaum. I hope you have an inner circle of friends so that you can share the struggles and details of your life, the joys and the sorrows. It's always good to have friends uh, to whom you can call. And I often say from the pulpit, this circle of friends, that whoever you call the first is your real pastor. I'm the one who just helps you from week to week. You call on me, but you usually call your friends first. And then you say, well, you better call the pastor. And that friend is your pastor. You need a pastor in your life like that. That's beyond me. I hope you have some good friends. These uh, three friends were with Jesus when he was transfigured on the high mountain. You remember a cloud came down, and at that time Moses and Elijah appeared and spoke with him, spoke with Jesus about his soon coming death, burial, and resurrection. John wrote his gospel around seven what he called sign miracles. These sign miracles were designed to help us understand the first three verses, that Jesus was God, and Jesus was God in the flesh coming to be with us. These miracles were intended to help people come to that conclusion. Only God could do this. And so those are such important miracles in his story. John ended his gospel with this thought. There are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them written down, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. John chapter 21 and verse 25. Now there was a special bond between Jesus and John. John came to be known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And John wrote more about the power of love than any of the other authors, the book of the Bible. And out of all the verses that John wrote, there is one on the subject of love that has become the most known Bible verse in all of the world. Some people don't know anything about the Bible, but somehow know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John chapter 3 and verse 16. A long time ago, I read this explanation of John chapter 3, verse 16, and it's always stuck with me. Perhaps it'll be helpful to you today. God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world the greatest number, that he gave the greatest act, his only son the greatest gift, whoever the greatest invitation believes the greatest simplicity. In him, the greatest person should never perish the greatest deliverance, but the greatest difference have the greatest certainty, everlasting life, the greatest possession. It's remarkable how a rowdy son of thunder became known as the apostle of love. I believe there's some sons and daughters of thunder watching this message. And Jesus wants you to experience the love of God that he came to demonstrate. He wants you to experience what it feels like to be completely forgiven and to have all of your sins taken away. He wants you to have the gift of eternal life. He wants you to know that you will go directly to heaven when you die. After Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, all of the Zebedee family followed Jesus. And today, everyone listening to this message is being offered the gift of eternal life. Pray with me. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to earth to show me God's love and for dying for me in my place on the cross. 
I ask you to forgive me for my sins and give me the gift of eternal life. If you just prayed with me, write to me and tell me about your decision to follow Jesus. Father, thank you that you have loved us so much. And as we come to you, we want to follow in your steps. Just as John, the son of thunder, became the gentle, caring apostle of love, you are transforming our lives. And thank you that you do that through Jesus. We say yes now to you, Lord, to your transformational power in our lives. And we pray that our families will come to know you as well. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.